my distinct privilege and honor today to uh, introduce to you our featured speaker this year. I want to tell you a little bit about, about Ann Corey. Uh, she's chairman of the Eagle Forum. Eagle Forum was uh, in my old hometown, Alton, Illinois. And uh, Ann is the daughter of Phyllis Shafley. I'm sure that many of you heard of Phyllis before. And uh, Phyllis and I campaigned together in Alton for Barry Goldwater in 1963 and 64. <clears throat> Ann had a regular radio program on, a weekly program on uh, Eagle Forum Live. And at this time, I would like to introduce to you our featured speaker, Ann Corey. It's a pleasure to be here, and what an honor to follow Ella Buzel. I mean, she said it all. You don't need to hear from me. She said, we, because here's, and I, I think you all got a pocket constitution. How many of our First Amendment rights have been violated this last year? How many of us thought a year ago that we would, a year later, have our churches closed and our, our Easter canceled, Mother's Day canceled, Fourth of July canceled, and even to the point where we were told how many people we could have for Thanksgiving dinner? This document cannot be a museum piece. This document cannot be under glass. This document only lives if we live it and we breathe it and we talk about it and we express it. So as I was listening to the wonderful recitation of, of our um, first 10 amendments, it occurred to me how many other amendments we have been violated this year. It isn't just the first amendment that's been violated. Let's talk about the right to a speedy trial. Do you know the court systems have basically been shut down for the last eight or nine months across the country? There aren't speedy trial. There are no trials going on. If you have a grievance or if there is a prosecution that needs to take, I think we have a prosecutor here. You having trials here at all? <laughs> What's going? They just suspended them again. You, 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 I'm sorry? They just suspended them again. They just suspended them again. Um, justice delayed is justice denied. And so we have in our uh, Bill of Rights the right to a speedy trial, and that has been violated uh, in the last year. Um, um, and, and who has done these violations? They are not our elected representatives. They are unelected health directors who are operating in the nature of public safety. And if you go back in history and if you read about horrible times where people lost individual liberty and individual rights, like in the French Revolution or in the grievous tragedies of the awful things that happened in the 20th century, whether it was the Soviet Union or communist China or Nazi Germany, Everything was done in the, under the guise of public safety for your own good to stay at home, mask up, don't challenge the authority of unelected health directives who have only your best concerns, only your best are they what they're thinking about. Well, there's only one person who knows your best concerns, and that's you. You should be the operator and decision maker of what is best for you. So let's take another amendment that has been horribly violated this year. And that is, no shall private property be taken for public use without just compensation. We have a terrible takings that is going on here. And the takings is the destruction of small independent businesses. When you say that the virus doesn't exist or isn't a problem in supermarkets, in Walmarts, in Costco's, but the virus seems to be incredibly prevalent in restaurants, bars, uh, neighborhood shops, 
that these so-called non-essential, well, they're essential to me, but they're not as non-essential. These so-called non-essential businesses must be closed because the virus only exists in small business, small independent businesses, whereas all these giant corporations get to make money off of the closure of small businesses. You know, we still need to get food and clothing. So instead of going to the neighborhood place, we're forced to use the giant business to get food and clothing. Well, isn't that an unjust takings of private property? So, so one of the essential things in our Constitution, which made it so revolutionary in our day, and certainly revolutionary today, is the idea that, you, that your economic liberty is critical to the survival of a free people. I mean, that is, well, revolutionary. Because it's saying that you, as an independent business person, as an independent operator, your economic, uh, your e uh, economy is so critical critical to you and then critical to building the fabric of this nation. And that is because without economic liberty, we cannot have political liberty. If we are individually reliant on a $600 a week paycheck from the federal government, a minimum wage, a, a minimum payout, so that w because our business has been closed, well, we have just then given over our political liberty to the grand poobah in Washington who is willing to dole out 600 here, 1,200 there, whether or not you can get the, uh, the next uh, program, the next bailout program, do you qualify for the next bailout program? Have, does the federal government decide, or does any government authority decide that you are essential enough to get a payment, or that you are non-essential and your business is, must close, and they close your business without just compensation. That is a violation of the Fifth Amendment. But that's not the only amendment that has been violated in this last year. I mean, I never thought I would see our country so be consumed with fear that we are willing to sacrifice both our economic liberties, our political liberties, and our individual self-worth. That we are saying that, no, no, my individual health is less important than the common good. And pr proposing or pushing um, uh, government resources for the common good, there's only one word to describe that, and that is socialism. And that is the elimination of our individual rights. Um, but yes, the Fourth Amendment, the right of the people to be secure in their persons, houses, and papers against unreasonable searches and seizures. Well, I don't know if anybody actually came to your door and said, you've got a 20-pound turkey. I want to see how many guests are at your table. But to me, that's what civil disobedience looks like today, is having a table full of people that you have invited, people that you want to socialize with, even if they're not in your family bubble or your pod, that you are freely willing to socialize and be with people at your table. This is not only community, this is fellowship, and this goes right back to our First Amendment. Because I think the right to assemble is so critical in this, because if you can't assemble the way we are beautifully assembling today, we have conversation. That's speech. We can talk. We can express our beliefs. We can worship. We can have a community of ideas. What is government so afraid of that they want to keep us from assembling together, to keep us from sharing our speech or sharing our beliefs? Is government today, and it's not just big government, it's also our community government, our, our local, our, our, our municipalities, our states. You can see this across the country. California now has 35 million people who they've told they're not supposed to leave their houses. The right to assemble and be with people, it's our first right. 
along with, of course, speech, religion, petition, and then let's talk about the press. We don't have a free press today. Our press is a shadow of what a free press should be. It is, I, it's a monopoly. It's, it's something where we have the inability to expressly communicate. And if you try to be a skeptic, you will be canceled. And so if you don't have a vehicle for expressing your ideas, then you are really prevented from, ha from communicating and preventing from exercising your speech if you don't have a way to broadcast it. And, um, and I think um, it's been well talked about how the, the printing press of today is social media. I mean, uh, we can make all the pamphlets we want, but to really distribute uh, uh, information, it is done via social media. And social media has decided that some speech is more valuable and other speech has to be eliminated, canceled, delisted, or taken away. And I, I certainly have had this experience, and I'm sure that many in this room have had this experience where they are, where, where they are not able to get your expression of speech out to, uh, to enter the marketplace of ideas because our ability to express speech, to broadcast our ideas, has been so curtailed by big tech. The big tech has decided that some speech is good and other speech is not good. Well, remember back in the good old days, well, some of the younger people are a little too young, but there used to be a free speech movement on college campuses in the 60s and 70s, that it was a radical idea promoted by the Democrat and the left to say more speech is better. And I agree with that, more speech is better. But why have they given up on those great ideas? Because the answer to speech you don't like is not to cancel speech, but to have more speech. And that's what our founding fathers said. More speech is good speech. And that you have to be able to express the ideas to do it. I mean, I recently heard that, um, that there are some on social media who are not going to allow any criticism of vaccines, for instance. Now, I don't know whether the vaccine is a good vaccine or a bad vaccine. There are a bunch of vaccines. I'm not a scientist. But I do know that I like to have skepticism. I like to have a lot of opinions. And there's nothing wrong with expressing opinions about any subject. That that is what, that's in our 1A, our First Amendment, is speech press, assembly, petition the government so that they know what, we, what grievances we have. They don't, even, they don't even like us to petition the government because when everything is now a virtual meeting, it becomes harder and harder to petition because they're so easy to uh, ignore your voices, your pesky voice that you have out. And then there is the freedom to exercise our religion. And um, if you haven't heard it, it's well worth listening to uh, Justice Samuel Alito's speech that he gave a couple of weeks ago to the Federalist Society about how, uh, how awful it is that the freedom to worship has been so squished by these uh, so-called health rules. Because there, there is a, um, uh, the, the federal courts uh, have made a decision that the virus does not spread in casinos, but it spreads in religious uh, worship. And uh, the, this kind of um, argument that big business can be open while we cannot gather is truly a violation of our First Amendment. It is a takings of our individual liberties, our community liberties. And that is why it is so critical that we pull out our, com our pocket constitutions, know these words by heart, and, ex and express it not only to ourselves, but everybody that we can talk to, everybody who will allow us to talk to. Because I think part of the push to mask up America is to eliminate our humanity, to cover us up so we can't see people's expressions, we can't look people in the eye and know what they're saying, that we have to create a barrier so that we cannot have fellowship with our humans. This is a denial of our humanity 
And we are social creatures. We don't want to live in isolated bubbles. We want to be a part of the community because the virus will come and go, and there will be new viruses. When this document was written, the virus at the time was smallpox. It killed 30% of people who contracted it. The virus today kills less than 1%. And we're going to throw this document out? Well, they, sure, they wrote this document under the, the smallpox pandemic, and it was a pandemic with 30% who contracted died. Keep that in mind when next time somebody says, well, if you get together, you're killing people. It was one of the expressions that I heard early on in, the, uh, in March, which is we have to close churches to save lives. Could someone please explain that to me? How does closing churches and preventing you from exercising your faith actually save your life? I think it's just a bunch of anti-religionists who want to stop people from, from gathering and being together and being a part of it. So the first 10 amendments, which we're celebrating today, there's no doubt they're critically important to, for us. The original Constitution is only four pages long. There are only 27 amendments, so it's, um, each amendment has tremendous value in it. But I call your attention to both the Ninth and the Tenth Amendment that expressly to say that all other rights are retained by the people. And the people are you and me. So we have the power. We have to use the power. We have to exercise it. But the power we have. And, and it's so important that all elected officials and unelected officials realize that they have to be limited in their power because they cannot, they should not violate these words in this important document. Um, and I am sorry that many of the legal challenges to some of these uh, rules that have taken place have not gone anywhere. The judges have said, no, no, we defer to the experts. Well, experts are human, humans are fallible, and I think what we have in this pandemic is, is, I call it, capricious enforcement. Some people are harmed, and other people have, have made a killing off of it, have made a lot of money off of the economic destruction that has happened. And that is what we, the people, have to, uh, have to continue to press our rights. Now, I'll just make a, another point, since it is, we're talking about the Constitution. There is an amendment that is not in this Constitution. And that amendment is the Equal Rights Amendment. And that is what Eagle Forum, the organization that I'm proud to be a part of, started and fought against and kept from the Constitution. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the amending, amending the Constitution is an enormous process. And because what it requires is a supermajority, a supermajority of Congress, a supermajority of the states, it requires a great national feeling that this is the amendment we want to do to put in the Constitution. They tried in the 1970s to put an amendment to the Constitution that would, uh, e uh, that would erase biological differences, that would, uh, that would make the whole laws of our country sex neutral. Only thing that would happen with that is that women would lose. And Eagle Forum was proud to be, have a big part in defeating that amendment. But bad ideas do not go away. They just get repackaged under new ways. And the effort to re erase biological differences has been repackaged and um, Eagle Forum published a couple of books this year. And, I ha and guess what? I have them available for sale for you. So. <laughs> uh, and the first book uh, we published this year is a book called Sex, Lies, and Children. And it is about the movement to erase biological sex from, uh, from, uh, uh, from people. It is a terribly destructive uh, movement. It has caused real harm to people. Uh, and there, and it is I consider to be a, a medical experimentation on children, yeah. 
And this is, um, it's a serious book. It is, it is shocking. And if you don't know about this movement, um, you know, be prepared because it, uh, this is the testimony that was done in Alabama. And if they'll do it in Alabama, I'm sure they're doing it in Indiana. It is quite incredible. And then the other book I want, Dave uh, mentioned um, uh, my mother, uh, Phyllis Schlafly. And, um, and I, think, um, I think someone else mentioned that there was a movie made about her earlier this year. And um, it was, the, the movie had an agenda. The, the agenda was to rewrite history as Hollywood, you know, Hollywood can't like a um, successful, famous, conservative woman. Uh, they have to try to tear her down. But in, because of this movie, I thought, well, you know, I should have some fun with it. So I published a book mm -hmm. called Faithfully Phyllis in the Kitchen, and it's a collection of her favorite recipes. So if you need, it's also available for sale. If you need a good uh, Christmas present, I have some, um, there, it's full of all kinds of, uh, of cute recipes and stories about my mother. And if you never knew my mother, uh, uh, you weren't uh, campaigning with Dave in Alton in 1964. Uh, I was not campaigning in 1964, but uh, <laughs> uh, the, uh, uh, she did have an extraordinary life, and for one big reason, she, she showed that it was possible for conservative women to have an influence in the political sphere. She brought out, she paved the way for women to, to enter the marketplace of ideas and be successful at it. And today, the, her, her legacy is hundreds of thousands of women who have joined in and whether they're, you know, today uh, active in the political sphere or active in politics, they all have my mother to thank for, for leading this pathway. And so it's really incredible what happened in the last election in November. It was supposed to be a huge socialist wave. If you recall, all these marches, all this socialism that was being pushed was going to usher in a new era in American politics. Well, not only did Republicans and conservatives win in the US House of Representatives, but pro-life women won in the US House of Representatives. And we have a whole new crew of women. You know, a couple of years ago, there was a big deal about the squad and uh, led by AOC, and I always said her name actually stood for Against Our Country. <laughs> but we have today a whole new crop of our new conservative squad of women who were there ready to go to Washington. So I would say don't be depressed about what has happened or what is going to happen. We've got a crew of people who have been energized and are ready to work. Many of these, I mean, the, for example, one woman, um, uh, you may uh, know her, Victoria Sparks. Yay. What I like about her story is that she knows socialism firsthand. And that is the message that we need to bring because what has happened in the last year when our economy was destroyed and millions of small businesses were put out of business by government fiat, what happened with that is that then we become dependent on government for our food. We become de dependent on government for ev our essentials in life, and we lose our economic liberties. That's what happens when socialism. And the way socialism is packaged today is with two four-letter F words, free and fair. And I would just caution you that you only get one chance to vote for socialism because every election subsequently mm -hmm. is a rigged election mm -hmm. and there is no fairness and there is no true free under socialism. What you have is the lowest common denominator ever. If everybody's equal, you only get mediocrity and there is no fairness because the elites always win. 
as, uh, as uh, what was it, George Orwell said, you know, some pigs are more equal than other pigs. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, and um, this, and I am, I'm just despondent that there are so many young people that I know who have um, drunk this idea that life needs to be fair. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, I may have liked to have um, played basketball. But there ain't no way I was ever going to play basketball <laughs> at five foot two. Um, so there's, there's nothing fair about that. Uh, and fairness, or trying to ensure fairness, is trying to ensure equality of outcome. And equality of outcome automatically means that it suppresses the ability to excel and succeed because your, your desires to do better and make better won't happen if you can only go so far and everybody has to be equal and fair in the end. And in, in the equality of outcome, do you get to choose the, the job you want to do? Do you get to choose the college you want to go to? Do you get to choose the major you want to make? No, because if you've ever experienced any time in um, in semi-socialist or socialist countries, there's only one thing that happens. The government owns your body and you make no, you have no freedom of choice on anything. So, close to 250 years ago, our, our founders had a vision for our country. And it's a tremendous vision. But they're not here to ensure it today. It is up to each and one, each of us and every one of us to ensure these rights and liberties that they were given to us. We didn't have to fight for them, they were given to us. But we only, they only have value if we fight for them. And, um, and so, you know, I, I remember hearing a speech by Justice Antonin Scalia where he was asked about the documents, uh, the constitutions of other countries. And he pointed out that the, um, the Soviet Union has the most beautiful Bill of Rights he's ever read. I mean, it ensures all these tremendous rights. And you know, sort of you scratch your head, the Soviet Union, they have a constitution with all these <coughs> rights, and these rights are great, and these are personal liberties and freedoms and rights that we want. How can that be? Ah because they don't have a Second Amendment. They don't have the way to enforce the rights. And the Second Amendment giving us, each and every one of us, the opportunity to protect and defend our rights through uh, gun ownership is critical to defending the First Amendment. We have the First Amendment because we have the Second Amendment. Now, I come from the land of uh, Ferguson, Missouri. I mean, we, uh, we have, uh, we, we started the Black Lives uh, Movement, Black Lives Matter movement with uh, tremendous rioting in the streets and destruction of personal property. And uh, earlier this year, a, um, a, a rabble crowd went through a neighborhood and a couple came out um, to ward them off their property. And what did the local prosecutor do? Charge the couple. Uh, to, with, uh, uh, with unlawful uh, use of a weapon. Well, defending your castle has been an, a long-standing um, feeling of, uh, of what it means to own, your, uh, to own a gun and to defend your property is to be able to defend your hearth and home, in addition to being able to defend your business. So um, I, am, I, am, I have fear for the future, and I have hope for the future, but it's only if we actually do our part can we continue this enormously successful document and keep it alive and going today. That's what we must do for not only for our lives, because we have seen how in a blink of an eye we have lost our essential liberties, just in a blink. Uh, I mean, I thought it would take decades to destroy what has been destroyed in, one, in eight months. But we can do it. We have success. Um, I don't give up hope on, um, 
on, uh, on, on what the future can be because after all, we have a whole crowd of people who, who uh, can recite the, the Bill of Rights. Mm -hmm. And uh, they're young and they're coming up and I have much great, I have great hope that they can, uh, that we will do better for our uh, lives and our community and live these words every single day. And don't let any unelected health director for your protection, not their protection, this is, we're doing it for you, for your protection, mm -hmm. keep you from living the life that you want to live. Because as Thomas Jefferson said, it is the pursuit of happiness. We must do that. And I thank you so much for having Amy here. It's just such a pleasure to meet you all. And I would really love to take questions from the audience.